I'm from Chicago, he just thinks I left the guns at the border. <laughs> Listen, you all been sitting for a few minutes, we got a little class participation as we move forward for the last few segments here today. So would everybody please stand up real quick, you've been sitting for a while, I know it's hard, I'm known being demanding. You all stand up, clap really, really loud. <laughs> Stop, sit, wasn't that great? Here's three things with that. Number one is, I'm always amazed wherever I go to speak, Whenever I tell people to do something, they just do it without even knowing why. That's number one. Number two, when you sit for a while, most of us sit during the day at work, right? And then we go home and we sit, and then we lay flat, and something, our, we start coagulating a little bit. Coagulation's good in gravy, but not in humans. That's the second thing. The third thing is, no matter what the hell I say, I already got a standing ovation. <laughs> and you all participated, whether you liked it or not. Glad to be with you. Um, this particular talk, I've done another TED talk back in 09 for NASA. Try standing in front of 1,500 people way smarter than you and trying to say something in about seven minutes that would make any sense. But it was a great experience for me, so I was really glad to come back and do this. Uh, but I'm the least qualified, and you've heard some of this today from other speakers. I'm probably the least qualified person on the planet to fill in the blank. I'm going to be talking to you about math. All of our, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? All our favorite subjects. Um, my best grades in school, grammar school, were lunch and recess. Excelled in them. When I moved to high school, my best grades were lunch and gym. Gym is just resets with a uniform on. My father was a banker. He loved numbers. He spent his whole day in numbers. This is a guy who would pull out reams of paper and sharpen pencils to do his income tax for like a week straight. I could care less about that stuff. When my report card was brought home, I'd get A's and B's, and where it said arithmetic or math, I got an F with a red circle around it. And it wasn't for fantastic, because I failed over and over again. I would sit at the table trying to do my math problems so long that I would stick to the chair, literally. You never been at dinner and you're eating something you don't like? For me, it was Brussels sprouts, and you take it out of your mouth and stick it underneath just to leave the, the room. For me, that was math. I would sit there and gnaw on this stuff. And I didn't understand what the language of it is. And why would I need to learn this? Who cares? The Cubs are playing. I don't care about math. Because I didn't understand the language. So real quick, the odds of me being on a TED stage in Canada talking about math are like a bajillion to one. And we live in a numbers game called life. So let's take a look at some of the numbers. The odds of being struck by lightning are 1 in 700,000. Anybody in here been struck by lightning? Didn't think so. The odds of being attacked and killed by a shark are 1 in 3,748,067. You all watch Shark Week? You get scared? When Jaws came out, there were people in Kansas, there's no water there, that had to go to therapists because they were scared about shark attack. The odds of being killed in a plane crash, 1 in 11 million. I fly all the time. I think it's an amazing miracle of, of modern technology, and I hear people complaining because they're late and think, at least you're not dead. One in 11 million. The odds of winning the Powerball jackpot, I had to come up with a number, so I picked the number seven million, $700 million. That's a nice chunk of cash. The odds of winning $700 million Powerball are one in 292 million. Anybody here won? If you did, you wouldn't be here. You'd be like running the place, right? One in 292 million. And people play all the time. Did you ever notice, too, the more money you could win, the more people play, which lowers your odds of winning? That's insane. But people do it anyway. Here's the big one, though. Here's why I'm here today. It's a reminder for myself and also for you. The odds of being born are one in 400 trillion. You know what that means, kids? It means you beat out 399 trillion other brothers and sisters that didn't make it. You showed up. The odds of you being here, do I need to go back through the slides? I will, but I won't. Are one in 400 trillion that you actually made it to the planet at all. 
So the next time you think you're having a bad day, I don't know if you all have traffic here like we have in Chicago, but when you're thinking you're having a little bit rough go of it, realize 399 trillion others didn't get here. You're here. Something to ponder. When I was in school and battling through math and arithmetic, I learned in a linear form right across the board. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Four plus four, all that, straight across. And when multiplication tables were introduced about fourth grade, there was a chart. There was a chart there. It was all about how things could be gone straight across and learned in a linear fashion. Our minds are so powerful that we take this stuff in and we create pathways, literally, that are in lines. You're all sitting in lines. There's lines that you come into this beautiful auditorium. You drive in lines all the time. And when you're a kid, what would happen? When I went to school, we stood in line to get in school. Then we stood in line to go to recess. Then we stood in line to go to the washroom. And then I stood in line to go to lunch. Then I stood in line to go to the washroom again, because it's after lunch. And then I stood in line to go home. And I did that for eight years. And pretty soon you get used to standing in line. So what happens to us as adults? You stand in line. We stand in line at the bank. We hate it because our patience has basically eroded due to electronic technology, right? So we stand in line at the bank, you stand in line at the supermarket. They got good reading on the way out, but that's a whole different show. And we stand in line everywhere. We drive in a straight line. When you fly in, when I came flying into Detroit, or you fly into any major city, all you see are lines, streets. People live in lines. So we have a linear mindset that is very, very difficult to overcome, and here's why. Oh, by the way, there's proof that I showed up. I'm one of 400 trillion. What are y'all laughing at? You have pictures just like this. My hair's about the same as it was then. I arrived on the planet 1229.58 at 8.10 in the morning. That's 1958, not 1858. And that is proof that I showed up. I have a birth certificate somewhere. All of you do too. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. So this linear math thing, here's how it works. The decimal multiplication table was taught as an integral part of elementary math around the world. You all know this. It's the foundation, really, for arithmetic operations with base 10 numbers. This is what our society is built on. A majority of experts and educators deemed it as necessary to memorize your times tables up to nine times nine. Like, what happens after that? You fall off the planet? So let's see if you all know your multiplication. Nine times nine is? And I'm in Canada. Amazing. If I was in Cameroon, they'd say that. Well, maybe in a different way. But everyone knows the answers because we were taught in a linear fashion. Are you with me? Do you understand this? The answer is yes. Let's try and really push the boundaries of, uh, of our learning. Oh, past nine times nine is how much? Six people know out of 150. What's 12 times 12? Thank you very much. 144. How do you know this? You memorized it in a straight line. 12 times 12 is 140. Or you can have the little blocks. It's like a crossword puzzle. So here's the challenge. To our linear learning mind, life should look like this. It should add up. So if you go to straight direction and do all the right things and meet all the right people, go to the right school, make the right amount of money, it'll all turn out just fine. Uh -huh. So do you see what we're doing here? We have a linear learning mindset that's been embedded. Not bad or good. There's no class action lawsuit here. You don't get to sue anybody and blame them because of the way you learn. You were just taught this. But this is what we were taught. It should all add up because it always did. You all know the answer to 12 times 12, and you haven't been in class for how long? Uh-huh. It's burned in. This is how life really is. This is actually a chart of my life right here. There's the start and the end. Rarely, if ever, adds up. And if I look at this chart, I can tell you three pivotal pieces on here that were not part of my linear learning. When I was 19 years old, I was working part-time in a, uh, a drugstore. I got electrocuted. Shouldn't be here. Guy saved my life. When I was 27, I was in a car accident, hit by a drunk driver who had five DUIs and no one pulled him off the street. No pulse. Shouldn't be here. Still here. When I was 43, I donated a kidney to my daughter, and I had to sign a piece of paper the night before that said, you could die when we do the surgery. Sign here. 
I did. That's how it looks. This is probably your life. There's no straight line. So let's get to human math, which I figured out on my own. Somewhere my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Baldry, is really impressed. The average life expectancy in Canada, total male and female, is 82.2 years. You're number 12 in the world. Give yourselves a round of applause. That's it? Like you're half dead? Give yourselves a round of applause. You're number 12 in the whole world. <laughs> USA, total combined male and female, 79.3. We're 31st. So the next time you see us in America raving the big styrofoam fingers, we're number one. That's crap. <laughs> we're not. So here's human math, how it works. We have taught in a linear fashion, everything adds up. Those 82.2 years means you get 29,930 days to be alive. That sucks. <laughs> it's a way of reframing it. What we're doing when you look at numbers like this is you break apart that linear mindset. In Canada, your 82.2 years turns out to 29,930 days to be alive. In the USA, my math is I get 28,835 days to be alive. So I might live to be 79.3, sounds way down the road. But you start adding up the days, 28,835 ain't a whole lot. Here's some things you have to take away from those numbers. You spend 25 years sleeping. Some people are doing it right now. So seven years lying in bed trying to fall asleep. Three years of doing laundry. Four years of talking on the phone at work. By the way, they cannot calculate yet how much time humans will spend on a cell phone because there's just no way to, to gauge that. Four years talking on the phone at work, three years of sitting in traffic, 11 years watching television, four and a half years eating. I'm all right with that. Five years of surfing the internet. Women spend one whole year of their lifetime deciding what to, hear, what to wear. Men, 10 minutes. Tops, the whole life, that's it. Two years in meetings. I'm not so good with this one. I've been in meetings that lasted two years, so I'm not sure about that. Eight and a half years shopping for various things, sundries and food. But the big one's missing, isn't it? The big one. You know, the one you're like, where's the big one? Here's the big one. Sex. Out of a whole lifetime, it's four months. Despite what it says at the checkout counter in all the magazines. That's about it. So here's the human math equation. You take 29,930 minus your age in days for the Canadians, 28,835 minus your age in days for the Americans, and you start working with that. So I'll be the, go I'll be the, the, the guinea pig here. Hello, my name's John. My number is 28,835 days. I've already used up 21,535 of that allotment. My remaining balance on my human math, drum roll, come on. Brrr, drum roll, please. Shh, I got 7,300 days to go. It's either really depressing or very inspiring. I choose the latter. It is a spur for me. It is a spur for me. Go back to the linear mindset. 12 times 12 always turns out to be 144, no matter what. It's set in stone. This number, not set in stone. So I looked at these, and I thought, who else has done some interesting things with very short amount of time? Joan of Arc gave victory to France and became a saint in 6,900 days. That's it. Terry Fox, you ever heard of him? Across Canada on one leg, a hero, a humanitarian. He had 8,030 days to complete his mission. That's it. Marilyn Monroe, to this day, 50 years after her death, is the largest selling icon in pop culture. She had 13,140 days to do it. John Lennon brought a whole new concept of the word imagine to 14,600 days. End of story. Princess Di, same amount of days as Marilyn Monroe. Humanitarian, amazing human being in a very short amount of time. This one, I think, is uh, personal to me. This is my old buddy, John Denver. We just celebrated 20 years since he's been gone just last week. He got 19,345 days. Here's what's interesting. He's been gone as long as I have days left, if I get to the average point. So here's a couple things I've learned that you might want to take to heart. Don't major in minor things. 
You get to decide what is major and minor, but you know when you're working on the big stuff in your life and when you're not. And everybody needs downtime, but don't major in minor things because you don't have time to waste for that. How you die, because we're all going to die, sorry to break it to you, is it nearly as important as how you live. It's not even close to it. Why you were born, why you showed up, one out of 400 trillion, is far more important as what's going to happen when you leave here. What you do in between is everything. It's everything. As I get to the end of this, I have a couple of thoughts that are so, have been so pivotal to me. I hope you can grasp this out of this whole little bit of time we had together. You can sit and count your days all you want. And even in the human math equation, there's no guarantee we're going to be here tomorrow. Zero. I may not get back to Chicago. You may not get home. And so that part of our mind that says death is reserved for someone else, fill in the blank, we're the someone else. Just because you're in the obituary page or you're not in it today doesn't mean you won't be there tomorrow. So here's a, a little class participation. How many people, just by a show of hands, uh, have ever been to a wake or a funeral? How many people have been to a wake or a funeral for someone younger than you? How many have been to a wake or funeral for someone your age? How many have been to a wake or a funeral for someone older than you? 100%. Everybody knows death. We just haven't experienced it yet. Here's the last part of this. How many of you have been to a wake or a funeral where they do a eulogy or tribute and you got to listen about that person's life? Great. Now, in a show of hands and be honest, how many of you, uh, when you went and heard that eulogy at that wake, that tribute, whatever it may be, that whoever gave the tribute of the eulogy went on and on about the person's political aspirations or political influences or how they voted? That's what I thought. How many of you have ever been to a cemetery and saw liberal or conservative or independent or other on a headstone? That's what I thought. Now, by a show of hands, how many have been to a cemetery and saw father, mother, sister, brother, sister, auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, beloved, or veteran? Seen that? So explain to me, or at least think about it yourself, how it is that what we deem is so important when we're alive, the one thing that separates us more than anything else, we think it matters the most while we're here, matters the least when we leave. How is that possible? I don't think you can add years to your life, but you can definitely add life to your years by doing one thing. Not just counting the days that you have left, but making the days that you have left count. Thanks. <laughs>